This video is an introduction to vector functions and how they can be used to represent curves in space. A vector function, or vector valued function, is a function whose domain is a set of real numbers and whose range is a set of vectors. If the range consists of vectors in two dimensions, then the vector valued function can be written in the form r of t equals r1 of t, r2 of t, where r1 and r2, the components of the vector, are themselves real valued functions. Or, if the vectors are in 3D, then we can write r of t with three component functions. If we think of the vectors as position vectors with their initial points at the origin, then the endpoints of the vectors r of t trace out a curve in r3 or in R2 if our vectors are in two-dimensional vectors. Sometimes we place an arrow on the curve to indicate the direction of increasing t values. For example, in this picture, this point here might be R of zero, and this point R of, say, one-half, and so on. Let's sketch the curve defined by the vector function with components t, sine of 5t, cosine of 5t. If we ignore the z component and just look at the x and y components, then it's like we're graphing x equals t, y equals sine of 5t, in other words, y equals sine of 5x. Ignoring the z component means we don't care about the height of our curve. It's as if the height were always zero and we were just living in the xy plane. In fact, this graph corresponds to the projection of our curve onto the xy plane. Similarly, if we ignore the y component and just think about the x and z components, that's like we're graphing x equals t, z equals cosine of 5t, or in other words, z equals cosine of 5x. That's what we should see if we take the projection onto the xz plane. Finally, if we ignore the x component, and just look at the y and z components, then we're graphing y equals sine of 5t, z equals cosine of 5t. Now since sine squared of 5t plus cosine squared of 5t is always equal to one, this is like saying y squared plus z squared equals one, which means our graph should be the graph of a circle with radius one. So the projection of our curve onto the yz plane should just be a circle. In fact, one way to think about this curve is to think of t as time and x, y, and z representing the position of a particle at that time. As t increases, the x-coordinate of the particle is increasing, and the y and z coordinates make it run around and around in circles in the yz direction. So this particle should trace out the path of a helix, otherwise known as a spiral or slinky shape. I'll paste in a better picture that I drew using the mat grapher. And here are the graphs that I made by looking straight down on the xy plane, the xz plane, and the yz plane. The reason these don't look like perfect sine curves, cosine curves, and circles is because there's some perspective built into the mat grapher. So it's not a perfect projection, it's a perspective drawing. Next, let's look at the vector value function given by this equation. Just like with real valued functions, we can talk about the domain, limits, and continuity. To find the domain of R of t, we need to figure out what values of t make sense to plug in here. In other words, what values of t give us real numbers for our components. Well, we know that t can't equal 1 because that would make us divide by 0 and not get a real number. In the second component, we also know that t plus 8 had better be greater than or equal to 0 since taking the square root of a negative number wouldn't give us a real number. In other words, t better be greater than or equal to negative 8. Looking at the third component, we know that we can't take the ln of a negative number so we need that t has to be greater than 0. We can't take ln of 0 either. 
Also, we know that we can't divide by zero. So we need ln of t to not equal zero. In other words, t had better not equal one. Putting this all together, we see that the domain is the set of all t values such that t is bigger than zero and t is not equal to one. Next, let's find the limit as t goes to one of r of t. We can find this by taking the limit separately of each component. Now the limit as t goes to one of t squared minus t over t minus one, I can't evaluate that just by plugging in one for t since I have a zero over zero indeterminate form. But I can use various calculus one techniques. For example, I could factor the numerator, cancel with the denominator, and get the limit as t goes to one of t, which is just one. Now for the second component, taking the limit as t goes to one of the square root of t plus eight, I can figure that out just by plugging in one for t. So that's just three. And finally, for the third component, limit as t goes to one of sine of pi t over ln of t, that's also a zero over zero indeterminate form. I get zeros on the numerator and denominator if I plug in one for t. Let me evaluate this one using L'Hopital's rule. So I'll take the derivative of the numerator, that's pi times cosine of pi t. The derivative of the denominator is one over t and simplify. And now I'm in a position where I can just plug in one for t and get one times pi times negative one or negative pi. Having evaluated the limits of all my components, I can now plug in and get a limit of one i plus three j minus pi k. Finally, let's talk about the continuity of R of t. We know it's not even defined for t values less than or equal to zero, but is it continuous on the interval from zero to infinity? Well, no, because it's not defined at t equals one either. But it does have a limit as t goes to one. We just evaluated it. Therefore, our curve has a removable discontinuity, otherwise known as a whole, when t equals one. If we wanted to make the function continuous, it would be pretty easy to do just by plugging the whole, which we can describe using a piecewise definition. In this video, we plotted one vector valued function that looked like a helix, and we analyzed another vector valued function in terms of its domain, limits, and continuity.